There are people who actually love lies. They love the evil lifestyle. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Hembry. I'm Corey. And I'm Ryan. And this is Quick Study Weekend Edition. Thank you for joining us. I want to talk about this because we're going to say it in a moment. It goes like this. Today, the one who loves lies, he is dedicated to evil. He is committed to destruction. And we'll talk about why that's important and how to stay away from that coming up in just a moment. Right now, Corey is here to tell us what she's doing. Corey? Well, today we're going to be talking about a few Babylonian leaders that show up more than once in the Old Testament of the Bible and also on the pages of history. Very interesting. Babylonian. That's going to be fascinating when we get to that. Anyway, Ryan, what's up? Well, today in this final interview, I'm asking Dr. John Sanford about a lecture he gave on the supposed transitional fossils of land and sea animals. The transitional fossils of land and sea animals. Supposed. Supposed yes. transition. Okay, that's interesting. All right, we'll talk about that and more. Now, what you want to do is get your Bible guide out and get your Bible out because we go through the Bible and study with us right now. Get ready for a course. Today, I am talking about important men from the nation of Babylon. Now, the first one we're going to talk about shows up in the Bible in the books of Isaiah and also in the book of Kings and Chronicles when King Hezekiah is on the throne in Judah. The Bible mentions a foolish move of Judah's King Hezekiah. Ambassadors from Babylon have come to wish Hezekiah well, and Hezekiah shows them all of the wealth all of the treasures of Judah and the Lord's temple. At the center of this history is one man from Babylon, Merodach Baladan. Merodach Baladan is very well attested to in history. He lived during the time of Assyrian dominance and he was a constant thorn in the paw of Assyria. A nuisance, a troublemaker that survived to pester three kings of Assyria. Merodach Baladan launched three full-scale rebellions against Assyria, in each one of them naming himself King of Babylon. There is at least one archaeological artifact that shows how seriously he took that role. A boundary stone has been found with a relief of Merodach Baladan giving a deed of property to the governor of Babylon, a job only the king could do. Merodach Baladin gathered his support base during the days of Shalmaneser V, the king in the Bible who began the destruction of northern Israel. He launched his first rebellion during the reign of Sargon II, the king who finished the destruction of northern Israel. He rebelled twice during the days of Sennacherib, once when Sennacherib first took the throne, and then again when Sennacherib marched against King Hezekiah. Merodach Baladan eventually grew old and died, but he didn't just leave the memory of his rebellions, he left a son who would grow up and launch a rebellion of his very own. None of Merodach Baladan's rebellions managed to overcome Assyria, but there is an interesting possibility that his bloodline is connected with that of Nebuchadnezzar, a king who finally did overthrow Assyria. Now, King Hezekiah always gets ragged on here when we're taking a look at the history, the historical account of his life, and we see him um, make this alliance with Babylon. Now, what we have to keep in perspective here is that Hezekiah has been used to this kind of crisis management his entire life, his entire reign. He has been preparing for besiegement and attack from the nation of Assyria. And so he's built up food, he's built up water and storehouses and money, he's built fortifications 
fortifications of his city and tunnels to bring in food and water. Uh, and he's also tried to make some political alliances. So while this was not a very good political alliance for Judah and Hezekiah, Hezekiah knew the risks that this could bite him in the butt, so to speak, and have Babylon eventually attack him. That's exactly what ended up happening with Judah. Now, of course, we know from our hindsight, looking back at this history, that Hezekiah always should have asked God first. It is difficult to work really hard, then have someone else tell lies about us. We end up further behind than ahead. All of our work seems to be wasted because someone lied about us. Well, God speaks of this in the book of Psalms. Chapter 52 tells us that one who lies devises destruction. What is his power? Will we always be the victim of lies? What can we do? Well, wise guys know that lies do not last for eternity. God has his way of bringing truth to the forefront. Now, this is both good and bad. We must ensure that we do not lie. Psalm 52, 1 through 9. Why do you boast in evil, O mighty man? The goodness of God endures continually. Your tongue devises destruction like a sharp razor working deceitfully. You love evil more than good, lying rather than speaking righteousness. Selah. You love all devouring words, you deceitful tongue. God shall likewise destroy you forever. He shall take you away and pluck you out of your dwelling place and uproot you from the land of the living. Selah. The righteous also shall see and fear and shall laugh at him, saying, Here is the man who did not make God his strength, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and strengthened himself in his wickedness. But I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the mercy of God forever and ever. I will praise you forever because you have done it. And in the presence of your saints, I will wait on your name, for it is good. Psalm 52, 1 through 9. As we continue in this scripture, it is amazing to look at how many people lie. And so many people do. And why people lie. I mean, the world is made of people who just say the wrong thing on purpose. And these lies are intense. And today we're going to talk about that and we're going to talk about what happens to us and why and why it's wrong for a believer in Jesus Christ to actually lie. Now, this is Quick Study Television as we go through the Bible in one year. I want to encourage you. We have four points in the guide. And what you need to do is get the guide out and get it ready. We're going to cover the first three points. But it's important for you to understand that the four points in the guide are there for you. And so I want to encourage you to get the guide. Later on, I'll tell you how you can receive yours. It's very important for you to do so. Now, in our review, we're talking about wisdom in truth. Now, that's obvious. And people say, well, truth, I like truth. Well, if we like truth, then how can we lie so much? It's true, we often do not tell the absolute truth, and this is a, a study for us for the whole life. Our reading is Psalm 52 to 55, and if you read chapter 52 to chapter 55, it keeps you in touch with the Bible and reading through the Bible in one year. Our focus today is going to be on chapter 52, verses 1 through 9. And as I said, we're going to cover those three points as we look at this word of lying. And it's important for us to understand. Now, we go directly to Psalm 52, where we just read. 
It is verses 1 through 4. Let us slow down and look at this. And the Bible says, why do you boast in evil, O mighty man? Look at that. Why do you boast in evil, O mighty man? The goodness of God endures continually. Your tongue devises destruction like a sharp razor working deceitfully. You love evil more than good, lying rather than speaking righteousness. Isn't that interesting? You love all devouring words, your deceitful tongue. And this is important for us to recognize the importance he places on the tongue. The one who loves lies is dedicated to evil. The one who loves lies is dedicated to evil. Now that's important for you to understand because I understand it and I, I need to remember that and all of us should. That if we are a believer in Jesus Christ, one of the main attacks upon us will be to utter lies, to tell things that are not really true. And that's very difficult. And in fact, we have a saying that uh, among preachers, we say, well, is that real or is that spoken evangelistically? <laughs> in other words, uh, did you expand that uh, little document longer than it should be? And that's really important because lying can be many things. And if we lie and devise our tongue towards evil, we set ourselves up for casting all kinds of mischief on conversations that need not be mischievous, beloved. We must be good people. We must be people who understand God and, and seek to deliver the truth where we can. And not to deliver the truth in a destructive way, because that's very important. You can deliver the truth in a calm way and also be very truthful. That's interesting. Now let's go on to the next scripture. We are in Psalm 52, verse 5. God shall likewise destroy you forever. He shall take you away and pluck you out of your dwelling place. He shall uproot you from the land of the living. Wow, uproot you from the land of the living. Well, let me tell you something. One who loves lies will be confronted by God for all that he has said and done. And beloved, it is true. If you love lies, and sometimes we don't even know that we're lying, or we don't even perceive that we're spinning a tail. God will confront us. And if we ask Jesus Christ to come into our lives and help us in this area, then he will make it true. I want to tell you that uh, very early in my life and some other times, God began to speak to me and tell me things that really aren't true, or that really are true, that I was saying that really aren't true. And that's important. We must understand that as we communicate, we must communicate in a way that perceives the truth, that tells the truth. And that is so very important. And sometimes, you know, we don't communicate uh, on purpose because we don't need to. And we don't need to tell them the truth. We need to just pray for them. That's very important. And as we look at this, we need to consider it. Now let's go back to the scripture and look at verses 6 and 7 of chapter 52. The righteous also shall see and fear and shall laugh at him, saying, Here is the man who did not make God his strength, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and strengthened himself in his wickedness. Now, this can be done by people who love God. One who loves lies also loves and depends on their wealth to save them. And see, so many people get involved with this and they tell lies and they speak lies and, and the next thing you know, they're walking in those lies and they actually believe some of those lies and, and they get themselves cast into a corner. That's very bad. We must make a commitment. We must make a decision in our lives to be truthful in this world. This world is full of lies. Let me tell you something. The news media is full of lies. And it doesn't mean that you go and say, well, that one lies and that one lies. It's, we're not need, we don't need to correct the news media. That's very important. But we need to understand that lies are so easily spoken, so easily told, so easily inferred that we must dedicate ourselves to truth. And where the truth is destructive, unless God tells us, we must hold back 
and not say anything. So very important. It's all about the mouth. It's all about what we say and how we say it. And this is a psalm that is worth reading again, checking out and meditating and applying this to our lives so we become truthful people. continue on in this theme that you and I established earlier in the program about talking about Babylonian men who were officials. Now this skips a little bit forward in history when Jerusalem gets taken by Babylon. Depending on what English translation of the Bible you read, the list of Babylonian officials in Jeremiah 39 verse 3 will be translated slightly differently. Names and titles are a difficult thing to translate, especially when they are so ancient that their meanings may be partially lost to time. Luckily, or providentially, two of the men listed in Jeremiah 39.3 have actually been found in the archaeological record. The first officer found in history is Nurgle Sharizer. From cuneiform sources, we know he really was a chief official, so important that he even married Nebuchadnezzar's daughter and eventually served some time as king himself. The second is, depending on your translation, Nebo Sarsakim, a chief officer, or Sarsakim the Rabsaris. Sarsakim the Rabsaris, translated chief officer, was one of these high officials of Nebuchadnezzar who entered the city of Jerusalem after a long two and a half year siege. The names of these officials were recorded in the book of Jeremiah and have passed down with it for thousands of years. To many, it seemed as if most of these names would remain obscure until a chance discovery. In 2007, a distinguished professor working in the British Museum sorting ancient cuneiform tablets deciphered an ancient temple receipt that was dated and signed. It was from Nebo Sarsakim, chief eunuch, dated to the 10th year of Nebuchadnezzar. In the Bible, the Hebrew word translated chief officer is literally chief eunuch. The name is right, the title is right, and most importantly, the timing is right. This receipt is dated to less than 10 years before the destruction of Jerusalem in Jeremiah 39. Well, this is the time that I said I'd stop by earlier and tell you how you can get a copy of the Bible Guide. The Bible Guide is written for you. You can't get it at a bookstore or anywhere else. You can get it from us. And that's the important thing to remember. And the Bible Guide is interesting because it has 32 pages in the month. One page for every day and an extra page in some months for setting up the scripture. And so if you would like a copy of this month's Bible guide, we have actually six of them here. These are through June, but the actual, the actual uh, members will be 12 for the year. They're exciting. Send an offering in any amount. If you're not a partner with this ministry, why? I encourage you to consider becoming a partner. We need you. I need your help. And so if you would pray about it and ask God to tell you what to do, he will speak. Father, I pray in Jesus name by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you would speak to the people and help them to know what to give and how to give and help them, Lord, in Jesus' name to stay pure and to stay right in their giving. And I ask, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, that you would help them as well when they get the Bible guide to study the Word of God.
Thank you for staying with us here on Quick Study Television as we go through the Bible in one year. Now, next time on the Quick Study broadcast, I'm going to be talking about something interesting. What can flesh actually do to us if we are trusting in the work of God? Now, that's interesting because that is answered by a song, and we'll talk about that on the next program. Right now, we need to talk to Ryan about what's going on. Ryan? Today, we wrap things up with Dr. John Sanford, and in this final interview, I ask him to tell us about a lecture he gave at the recent creation conference about the supposed transitional fossils of land and sea animals. So the whale story is really interesting because like Tiktaalik and like Lucy, you have these beautiful um, artistic renditions in the textbooks. And you look at the artistic rendition, you go, wow, that looks just like something that's halfway between a fish or, or an amphibian, or that looks just like a halfway uh, creature between an ape and a man. And you don't, they don't show you the fossils, they show you the artistic renditions. Problem is the artistic renditions are based upon the fact that the paleontologist tells the artist, this is a transitional form, so make it look transitional. And so, what the whale transitional forms, if you actually look at the fossil evidence, they're laughable, really laughable. Uh, the, the big first evidence that they had, any fossil evidence that supported land animals, a wolf-like creature evolving into a whale, uh, the, the, only, the first evidence was Pachycetus, and they found a few teeth and a few bits of the jaw, and they said, they reconstructed it and said, this is what it looked like, and it was, you know, Practically, uh, practically a whale, and it was. It lived in the ocean, and it swam. Had a big fluke tail, and you know they draw it. And then they found some more of the skeleton. They published this in Science, and it was mainstream science. And it was immediately that image, that drawing. They made, they made an artistic rendition of a full, fully whale-like creature based upon a few teeth and a jawbone. Um, was immediately put in all the textbooks. So you, if you look at textbooks just a few years ago, had the, the picture of this creature swimming around in the ocean. They found later the more complete skeleton, and it's clearly a wolf-like creature, four legs, a tail, uh, clearly uh, would have struggled to swim, certainly couldn't uh, do what whales do. Uh, just a classic land animal. And um, so they, they said it's still, okay, Pachycetus now looks like a wolf, now they have a more full story. You see, they can now know exactly what the land animal looked like before it became a whale. But there's nothing in between. Well, then they found some things that were in between. But in every case, the fossil evidence was more like the jaws and teeth, where they have a limited skeleton, which actually looks quite land animal-like, or perfect. There's no evidence that it's an aquatic creature. And then they flesh it out with artistic imaginations. And now they have a whole series of fossils. And so, and they're in the textbooks. They're very convincing textbooks that take you from a wolf-like creature to a kind of a pseudo uh, whale to something that's almost a whale to a whale, but they're all cartoons. And so people are uh, losing their faith based upon cartoons and textbooks. And they never, you know, if you just look at, show the fossil evidence, no one would be convinced, absolutely no one. Did you hear what Dr. Sanford said? The pictures in school textbooks of alleged transitional forms are an extreme misrepresentation of the true fossil evidence. Children are being lied to about what the actual evidence is. The actual evidence being that there have been no true transitional fossils found anywhere, ever. The reality is if evolutionists only put the facts in the textbooks, then not very many people would believe in evolution. And this is the problem they face. I want to warn everyone to be very, very careful about what you assume to be fact. We must seek out the evidence for ourselves rather than just blindly believing what everybody else says. Now, with that being said, I'd like to thank Dr. Sanford very, very much for taking the time to sit down with me and discussing many of these different things. And on a personal note, I'd like to say that Dr. Sanford is one of the nicest and most genuine people I've ever met. Now, please go pick up a copy of his book. It's called Genetic Entropy and the Mystery of the Genome, and you can find it at creation.com along with many other resources. Very good. Now, that's creation.com, in case you didn't get that. And Ryan, we promote them. 
uh, not because uh, you know they have products that we don't like, but because they have products we do like, and that's very important. So creation.com is where they can get that book from Dr. Sanford, right? Absolutely. I, I go there a lot myself because it's a great resource. All right, so we don't necessarily want you to go on and ask a bunch of questions, but they'll take care of that. But if you want the book, go there. They have other material there. They have the Answers book. It's really good. And Creation Ministries International, of course, is a very good friend of ours. They come in and they tape in this studio here. It's very exciting to see them. And you actually directed for them. You actually directed twice on a big event they had up here in Canada. Uh, yeah, their Creation Super Conference. They have it uh, once every three years here in Canada, I believe, and then it goes into different countries. Those and we decided to uh, help them with it, so we broadcast. We took our material there and uh, set up the broadcast, and we broadcast on the stream. Yeah, it's really great to help them out because they have a really great calling as a ministry, and you know they, they really have a good heart. They're not in it for you know money or fame or anything like that. They're really taking their research and making it accessible for people. All right, so very good. That's the reason that we talk about this ministry a lot, because it is very close to us. We're not associated other than just friends. And uh, in the Canadian office, uh, Richard and, uh, of course, Calvin, they're my friends, and it's very good. We know Dr. John and Dr. Sanford and many others. So we want to encourage you to do that, but don't go to our website. Go to their website. Right now, here is Watch and Pray. Let's take a look. There is no substitute for trusting in the mercy and the grace of God. We grow wise when we do this. God is perfect, we are not. It is important for us to remember that we have many flaws. This is not normal, but the result of sin. Sin is not a popular word in today's world, but it is a truthful fact. We are people who die at the end of our life because of sin. We are people who have many problems in life as a result of sin. Sin is real and hard. But the Bible tells us how to grow wise by coming to Jesus Christ and confessing that we are not perfect, but we are people who need God. We need His forgiveness and all help to overcome sin. Jesus Christ lived 2,000 years ago, and he saw this day. He saw the day that this program would be broadcast, and he said, I want to bring my thoughts to those people. And his thoughts are this, that we're lost in sin, and that he gave his life, died on the cross, and rose again so that we could come to him. And if you come to Jesus Christ today, if you say, Lord, I want you to be my Lord and forgive me of my sin, help me today, he will do it. Pray today for Jesus Christ to be Lord.